Hi, I'm Associate Professor Zachary Munn. And I'm Dr. Danielle Pollock. And together we're part of a JBI scoping review methodology group. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about scoping reviews and a new article that has come out. Yes. So, Danielle, can you tell us a little bit about scoping reviews? Yeah, so scoping reviews are a type of evidence synthesis that they do differ from systematic reviews. For scoping reviews, we're probably asking a lot more background type questions. So in a systematic review, you'd ask a question about what is the effectiveness of, say, grommets on um, hearing loss, and those outcomes might be uh, speech or hearing. But for scoping reviews, we might go, well, what is the evidence out there um, and what are the outcomes um, of hearing loss um, and maybe the outcomes of using grommets. So we're not so much measuring effectiveness, but really I think these scoping reviews help for researchers um, and even decision makers when we're turning, um, when we are trying to map the available evidence. So they're a very broad spectrum question that can be answered in a scoping review. So this recent paper that you've led on data extraction, why did we need another paper on guidance for scoping reviews? I think when we wrote the guidance, it was very overview. Um, and so when we got to the nitty gritty, and I always think about um, a PhD candidate going, you're gonna do a scoping review and going, what do I, what are the actual how-to steps? What do I need to do once I only select the data, select the articles, what do I then do with it? And I think there was not that, you know, step-by-step -step how-to guide on, on each how to extract, where to extract in a yes. scoping review. I think there's a lot of misconceptions by reviewers to extract from the results sections of the scoping review when really we're not going to be focusing on that area as much as when you would do a systematic review. Yeah, so what were some of the problems or challenges that, that you've seen in, in the way people did extract and analyse data in scoping reviews? Yeah, I think the big thing was the extraction of results. Um, people would extract those results and then have questions about what are the experiences um, and those types of questions are better suited to a systematic review where you can do critical appraisal. But when you extract from the results, then that also kind of tempts you to do um, a bit more detailed synthesis that a scoping review really isn't designed for. So, for example, we're seeing people doing meta-analysis in scoping review or, you know, thematic synthesis or meta-aggregation. Now, those types of approaches are really more suited to the systematic review because scoping reviews are really there to kind of map um, what is out there and, you know, even categorise um, rather than, you know, actually answer very direct, narrow questions that would have potentially clinical significance. Right. So. I've come across scoping reviews where people extract point estimates or results, yeah. relative results ratios, etc., and then they make conclusions in a scoping review about, say, a particular intervention being more effective than other approaches. Mm. Is this not what you should be doing in scoping reviews? Ideally, because um, we don't want to, you know, call out people that may have done that. Um, but ideally, what you'd want to do is if you're ever looking at the effectiveness of an intervention, we have to remember the audience that that's going to be for, and that is going to be for clinicians and, and for guideline developers. So in order for that piece of evidence, which is extremely important, you really need that to go through a process of critical appraisal and then even to a gr using a great approach for certainty of evidence because we need to make sure that that included evidence is true and reliable. Um, but a scoping review, we don't necessarily do critical appraisal in it. So that's why those types of questions are really suited to a systematic review approach. Uh, so what do we do in terms of synthesis and scoping reviews? Yeah, so most of the scoping reviews you would probably do is more on frequency. Um, so how many uh, of these articles are, say, uh, you know, observational studies or how many of these are, you know, qualitative synthesis, for example. Um, so it's more about the frequency of those um, articles, for example, or, you know, where are those articles located so you can get a good map of where the evidence is located in the world and maybe you can make comments about the fact that we actually need to engage with low and middle income countries. Um, for example, so more those frequency. So, so largely, you know, basic descriptive statistics yeah. like frequency counts, percentages, etc. Yes. As opposed to say synthesised estimates through meta analysis. Exactly. Okay, wonderful. What about 
the more qualitative data because sometimes this can be tricky, right? It can be tricky, and I've also fallen into the trap. So uh, the trap of wanting to do further synthesis because I got so excited about the data. But you know, if you do have that more qualitative data, or if you are actually extracting from the results section, or even um, a recent uh, scoping review that we conducted on patient journey mapping, um, was that we didn't extract from the results, but why were researchers using that particular methodology? So that type of question was getting qualitative text-based responses or textual um, evidence. So what we then did was we used a very um, basic qualitative content analysis and our article goes through that process. Um, and what we did was uh, you know, extract all that text and then come together as a group really, um, and then categorize those responses and then put a frequency on that categorization. But we try to not go into deep level interpretation of the evidence, very surface level. And I guess from a qualitative perspective, it's about more about categorization and grouping of information that's been coded. But that information isn't necessarily the actual findings or results. No, and that's, no. Is that the big difference between systematic reviews and scoping reviews? Exactly. You know, as I said, with some um, that patient journey mapping um, example, we did not extract from the results of those papers. We extracted from the methods um, or the introduction or even the abstract and discussion about why they utilise this methodology. We avoided that results section, but. I will say in extreme caution, and I'm going to emphasize the extreme caution, um, there may be situations where you do extract from the results. For example, maybe a barriers and facilitators, you're trying to work out what are the barriers and what are the facilitators. Yes. Um, so you might you know, extract barriers and facilitators, but again, what you do with that information isn't leading to recommendations for clinical practice change. They are, these are the categories, and you may even go, well, these are the psychosocial barriers, or these are the financial barriers, um, rather than go into the, again, higher level um, interpretation. I see. So you might have some sort of a priori framework, yes. or maybe one that you develop de novo to actually code and categorise information. Yes. This is interesting, though, reviews or barriers and facilitators should you use a scoping review approach? We're still trying to answer that question. The jury actually, is still out. Yeah, the jury is still out. We're actually doing a scoping review on, on which is the best methodology for barriers and facilitators because there is no consensus on it yet, mm -hmm. hopefully in a year. Well, that's, it's really interesting. I can see a number of ways that you could approach a barriers and facilitators review. I as, agree. As, as, as I'm sure you're finding out in your scoping review of barriers and facilitator systematic reviews. Yes. Wonderful. So you've told us some of the principles about data extraction, synthesis and analysis and scoping yeah. reviews that we, uh, we need to have rigorous and transparent extraction processes in place, uh, that we're not necessarily interested in the point estimates or results or findings of the individual studies and that our synthesis is normally more descriptive type analyses, frequency counts, etc. So they the principles, what about the practicalities? What, how do we actually do it? Are there software or tools we should be using? What, what advice would you give to someone who needs to do this? I think that the very first principle is ensuring you have a really good protocol. Um, so from the very start, you have a good foundation to know exactly what you need to do. For me, a protocol is that recipe card for success. Because um, if you have any questions, you're going to be able to go back to that protocol and go, what did we actually envision this um, review to be? Because you are going to have questions in that extraction stage. Because often you want to extract more than you than you uh, need to. Um, and I'm definitely that type of person that can go, oh, I really like that. Let's extract that. Um, so going back to the actual question at hand. So for me, a good f protocol. Then I'm also looking at my team and the resources available. Now, scoping reviews can be extremely big. We're currently working on a scoping review that has over 300 articles. Um, and so also I've worked on much smaller scoping reviews. But you might not know what resources for people you need until you've actually done the screening. So for example, I was told that there was no evidence available in this area. So we need to do a scoping review, but it should be a really small one. And next minute we have over 160 evidence sources. So wasn't exactly a very planned approach for that. Now you can do one of two things. You can have a really big team when you're extracting 
But with that, you really need to make sure that when you're piloting, that everyone is on the same page. Um, because a big team means potentially more errors. Or you can decide, no, we're gonna have two people or a very small team into to data extract. Um, and then we can have that constant communication with the team. And I think that's really important as well, is ensuring that you have those open channels of communication about deadlines, um, expectations, and if you do need to change what you're extracting, um, and any misunderstandings. So being able to check over and to ensure we're extracting the right things. Because you don't want to get to the end of 300 evidence sources and go, got to re-extract those again. No, definitely not. Um, and I think the other thing is, look at the software you have available. I'm not going to be here to recommend a software to um, everyone because some costs more than others. Um, some are free and some are not. So you really need to look up what your resources are. A lot of people use Excel and you will use drop downs within Excel to make for a consistent data extraction. Um, others use Covidence or even JBI summary as well. Um, but you need to use something that is comfortable for you um, and also comfortable for your team as well. Um, so if that's also doing training sessions in those software to again ensure that your team is on the right track, um, you know, invest in that because if you get that extraction right, it's going to allow for an easier um, analysis process and then presentation process as well. Wonderful points. What about actually analysing the data? Oh goodness, I've again it comes to a clean data extraction. Um, uh, don't underestimate this this data cleaning process because it can take it can take a long time um, depending on how the data extraction actually came out. Um, so make sure you actually invest that time to check um, and to actually make sure that your data extraction is um, consistent. You know, for example, no versus not mentioned. Um, for example, can be vastly different when it comes to doing that analysis in, say, Excel or you know, even SPSS if you want to do basic descriptives. Um, but when it comes to the analysis, again, going back to the question and answering what is it that we're trying to answer here? Um, if you are trying to go, what is the available evidence? Well, what does that actually mean? What do you need to know to be able to say what is the available evidence out there? The, good teams I've worked in is actually bringing the teams together. So actually having meetings about your, you know, your analysis and going, well, what do we actually need to do to answer this question? Do, do we actually need to extract more? Hopefully not. Um, but being able to go, well, what's the best approach? And then think about how you want this to be presented. Um, I think for scoping reviews, it can be death by table. Yeah. Yes. And we, we don't need to, the tables can be really big in scoping reviews. So be inventive. Remember that we actually want this information to go out to the community, you know, an academic community, or it could be um, patient partners or anyone really. So we need to make sure that this information is easily digestible and, you know, be able to make social media tiles about, you know, your the results that you have found but also when people are reading it they're not just going to go I am going to refer to table one which has all the extracted um, you know be able to break that table down a bit more into to something that's a little bit more um, or really the world joyster when it comes to presentation and scoping reviews oh I think they're excellent excellent points and we should always keep the end user in yeah. mind when we are preparing these scope and review reports and as you say think about the best ways to visualize and present data really really important and what do you hope this article is actually going to achieve what what are your hopes and dreams for it i hope for clarification um and i hope for that you know phd candidate who's completely lost on the how to's can read this article and go i know exactly what i need to do i feel really confident in my approach um, and also to be able to help maybe when it comes to the peer review process um, for people to be able to refer to this article and go, well, actually, we've utilised this methodology um, and that's why we're not doing a meta-analysis for our scoping review. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, and hopefully, as you say, it will help, help save, solve some of the confusion 
in the yes, field yes. and help cl people clarify what they're going to do. Really important contribution to the field. Thank you for driving this forward, Danielle. Is there anything else you wanted to mention about scoping reviews or JBI and our scoping reviews before we finish up today? Yes, just that if you would like more information about scoping reviews, join our JBI scoping review network. Uh, we send newsletters, we talk about our latest events um, and our latest papers within that newsletter. And we also highlight the work of our network as well. So please, please, please join our network um, and send any of your scoping reviews to us so we can highlight um, your fantastic contributions as well. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. If you have any questions about scoping reviews, please do join the JBI Scoping Review Network and keep an eye out on all of the scoping review happenings from JBI. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle.